We've been on a story for the last four or five weeks, for five weeks actually. And it's a story of Gideon and it's in Judges chapter 6 and Judges chapter 7. And it's a story about God desiring to rescue a people that have been oppressed by an enemy called the Midianites. And they were oppressed and they were under siege to the point that they were reduced to starvation. Now they got in that position after God gave them a victory. They ended up taking their victory and throwing it away. And they started serving the gods of that country. So this, instead of continuing to use their victory and their blessings to thank God, they began to serve their pleasures. They began to serve their lusts. And they began to forget about God altogether. And because of that decision, they ended up being subject or they ended up being ruled or oppressed by the gods that they served. No longer was God leading their life. Their addiction was leading their life. Their pleasure was leading their life. Their past was leading their life. And now they found themselves in seven years of massive oppression. They lost everything. Finally, after hitting rock bottom, they cry out to God. And they said, God, we forgot about you, but save us. And as soon as they cried out to God, God began to carry out a rescue mission to rescue a people that turned on him, but turned back to him. And we serve a God that has, he serve a God that will forgive you quickly, instantly. And you, why is this important? Because some of us in this room, you've messed up. And this is what you've done. You've beat yourself up. You've condemned yourself to the point that you feel like you have to earn your way back. And what God is saying, yes, you messed up. Yes, admit that. And yes, you're facing consequences for the bad decisions you've made. Accept that. But there's a God that paid the price by sending his son to be punished and pay the penalty for every single wrong thing you've done. Accept that. And receive the forgiveness and the new beginnings that he has for you. God is not here to judge you. God is here to rescue you. God's on a rescue mission. So today, we're going to talk about the story of Gideon, but I want to lay some foundation on just three major points that I want to make today. And number one, God is on a rescue mission. Rescuing people from the power, penalty, oppression, addiction, and misery of sin. In Luke 19, 10, it says this. For the Son of Man came to find and restore the lost. In the ERV version, it says this. The Son of Man, the Son of Man is Jesus, came to find lost people and save them. So Jesus came to find lost people. Now this word lost means simply this. It means hurting people. It means people that have fallen away from God. It also means people that have ruined their lives by the decisions that, he've, we've, that they've made. If you feel like I've ruined my life, God is here to let you know I'm here to save you. I'm here to restore you. Good news, you and I don't need to stay in the place that we're at. There's a way out and his name is Jesus. It's important for you to know that, that God is on a rescue mission. And God has passed on this rescue mission to us. And in Acts 20, 24, I'm going to read a scripture here. We're going to see the writer of this verse say something that really illustrates passion and focus on this mission. And I pray by the time 
this teaching is done, that God does a miracle in our heart, that we will have passion and awareness of the people that are lost all around us. It's so easy to live out Christianity and be busy doing church stuff, ministry things, and forget about the mission of saving the lost at any cost. I cannot put that passion in anyone. Only God can create that passion in your soul. But I've also realized there's times in your life that you got to start working your passion. What I mean by that is don't wait till you're passionate to take action. Take action and you'll become passionate. Whatever areas you're investing in, you'll develop passion in. You might have just came today to check it out. But why don't you go ahead and invest in it? Watch yourself investing in God, investing in studying the Word, investing in going through the growth track, investing in discipling someone, and watch your passion increase. So let's look at this verse. Let's see if you could see the passion that he has. In Acts 20, 24, it says this, but my life is worth nothing to me unless I use it for finishing the work assigned to me by the Lord. The writer of this scripture is saying, I've come to the conclusion that my life has worth and that worth is in my assignment. Using my life to fulfill the assignment that Jesus has given me. Think about this. What if Jesus literally met with you and spoke to you, says, daughter, son, let me give you my assignment. Would you write it down and would you take it seriously? And what if this would happen? You stand before God and he says this, well done, good and faithful servant. You've accomplished the assignment. Because actually, that's what God has done. Easter's coming around. Last year, Easter was canceled. This year, Easter's coming around. And this is what I thought of. Let's give the devil double for all the trouble. Let's make this Easter the biggest Easter we've ever seen, bringing people to Jesus like we've never seen it before. How many believe that a great revival in America can begin on a resurrection Sunday? You notice that I'm talking about America. And I'm not just talking about San Bernardino. Because God is interested in just reach, not reaching a city. He's interested in reaching a nation. But it starts with a group of people like us that are on assignment. Be intentional and let's get serious about this. See, I, I you, it's my life is worth nothing to me unless I use it for finishing the work assigned to me by my by the Lord Jesus. The work of telling others the good news about the wonderful grace of God. So I use my life to share this good news message. It's not a message about religion. It's a message about the grace of God. This is a message that tells everyone that you don't have to work yourself into salvation. Jesus already paid the price for every wrong you've done. And you can receive the free gift of forgiveness and eternal life and be made a son of God, a son or daughter of God by just placing your faith in Jesus. You know why that's important? Some of us here, you're working for something Jesus already worked for. 
and it makes you feel like you're not good enough because all says you're trying too hard. You're actually trying to do what God did. Your job is not to do what God can do. Your job is to do what you can do. And what you can do is simple stuff. But God is the one that does spiritual stuff. You can't save you. You can't deliver you. You can't make, your, you can't make yourself sound of mind. You can't save your husband. You can't save your wife. You can't heal you. But there's a God that sent his only begotten son. And he paid the price. And now it's a good news message. It's a message of grace. Someone say gift. It's a gift. Salvation is a gift. Eternal life is a gift. I love it. So he goes, look, listen to verse, verse 25. And now I know that none of you to whom I have preached the kingdom will ever see me again. Now, it's interesting. He said, I've used my life. I found it. If I don't use it for this assignment, it's worthless. He goes, but I, I want to let you know something. I'm checking out. I've got some news from God that I'm leaving this earth. And I'm talking to you right now, but this is going to be my final message. You're never going to see me again. This next assignment that I'm going to in this next city will require my life. But he goes on to say this. I declare today that I have been faithful to the assignment. And if anyone suffers eternal death, it's not my fault. For I didn't shrink, shrink from declaring all that God wants you to know. You know what he was saying? If you end up eternally lost and in hell, forever. It's not my fault. It's not my fault because I didn't shrink back. I didn't backpedal. I didn't let fear overcome the message. It wasn't that I wasn't scared at times. It wasn't that sometimes the ridicule was off the charts. The pain for preaching the message, it really hurts. The rejection of standing up and sharing this good news message in a society that doesn't care about God, at times it made me feel like quitting. It wasn't easy to be always the odd man out. But when the opportunity came, I thought about your eternal life. And I realized that Jesus gave me an assignment. And I was willing to suffer. I was willing to die. I was willing to go through whatever I needed to go through to share this good news message. Now, if you die and you don't make it, it's not my fault. Because I did not shrink back. Yes, there were times that I felt I was going through so much it was easy to forget about you. Yes, there was times I was so busy with my kids and my life and my schedule that it would have been easy not to put you on the schedule. After all, someone would say, I'm an American. I got games to play, sporting events to go to, got to do a little gambling, got to go to work, put a 40-hour shift. I got to watch some TV. I got to watch some YouTube. I have to update my Facebook. I got to do my Instagram. I got I got, I got stuff to do. I got to balance my checkbook. I got money to put in there. I, I got goals. Hashtag goals. Hashtag relationships. Hashtag whatever. I got golfing to do. I got baseball to do. I got kids to take to soccer practice. Where am I going to find time to reach someone for Jesus? Now I'm not going to ask you that. Where are you going to find time to fulfill your mission? 
Maybe this is a season where God is saying, I gave you a year off so you could find some time for me. I gave you a year off to get your priorities back in order. I didn't give you a year off to develop a mediocre, lukewarm life. I gave you a year off to get on fire and get the mission back in your system and get some passion back. Now, I'm going to give you some assignments. It's just simple assignments. Write down 10 people. Make a hit list. <laughs> of 10 people you want to bring to church and you want them to know Jesus. You want them to become discipled. And I would say this, make it an event. You know what I mean by that? Be intentional. Maybe sit down with your family and write down these 10 names with your Power 12 group, with your ministry, with your wife going to dinner. And just start thinking about 10 names that I'm going to follow up on them and I'm going to invite them as if their eternal life depended on it. How about this? Start a new habit. Until Easter, 21 days to develop a habit. How about these next 21 days, every day, you make it a goal to just invite one person. Oh my gosh, that's hard. No, it's not. It's people all around you. Do you know why some Christians have lost their, their empty and their Christians? Because when you're not fulfilling, when we're not fulfilling assignment and we're not accomplishing what God has called us to accomplish, we're empty. When we do what God has called us to do, there's joy. Maybe what's missing is the mission. So let's make it, I love what she said. We're made, we've made it our own mission. Could it be that church has been a self-help place? That we're so interested in blowing up, big, becoming big and accomplishing great things that our testimony is just what we're doing and not what God's doing through us? I'm just thinking out loud. <laughs> so he made it a mission. Look, he says, if anyone suffers eternal death, that's not my fault. For I didn't shrink back from declaring all that God wants you to know. There's some people lost and they're hurting and they're broken out there. And they don't know how to get out. They're depressed. They don't know how to get out. There was a young man that came first service. He goes, pastor, thank you for the message. He goes, I'm hurting, I'm broken. I've been drinking my problems away. I'm depressed and I'm suicidal. I'm destroying everything in my life. Help! He came here, he came here today. Part of the streets of San Bernardino, young man. Came to the front, gave his life to Jesus today. He goes, I'm living, I got his name a number. We're gonna follow up on this young man. We're going to disciple him, and he's going to live for Jesus, and we're going to kick out every spirit of suicide, depression, and addiction in his life so he can live for God. Is there anybody that cares about somebody? So number one, God is on a rescue mission. Number two major point, God rescues people through people. And I'm going to say something that's deep, but it's simple. He doesn't do it any other way. When God wants to reach people, he does it through people. When he wants to rescue someone, encourage someone, heal someone, build someone, he sends a person. He did it with Moses. He did it with Nehemiah. We're going to go to Gideon. He did it with Gideon. Even Jesus had to become a human to reach humans. The pattern never changes. So now we look at this story with Gideon. God called Gideon to rescue a na the nation of Israel. The people cried out, help. And God says, I always do it the same way. I got to raise somebody to reach somebody. I got to call somebody 
to reach somebody. And I want you to get this. It's not just about your personal victory. There's a lot of victories that are going to happen through you. The devil's trying to keep you on the front lines, the, the same line of resistance that you're sitting there with the same exact issues so you never get to somebody else. Right? Freely you give as you received. Send me free, Lord. And then God says, I set you free. Now go out there and set some people free. <laughs> heal me, Lord. I heal you. Go out there and heal some people. <laughs> Give me a sound mind. I'm crazy. <laughs> I heal your mind. I make you uncrazy. Go reach the crazies. Lord, I'm a pervert. I haven't heard anybody say that, but you, there's some perverts in here. I guarantee that. <laughs> That'd be awesome if someone finds I am a pervert. I am bad. I unperv you. <laughs> You're unperv. Be holy. And go out there and make some people holy. Come on, give God some praise that God does it for you so you can go out there and do it for somebody else. That's probably never been said in the history of the world, unperved. <laughs> what did you learn at church? Uh, what I learned was that if you're a pervert, you could be unperved. It's deep, bro. It's deep. All right. So God called Gideon, look at this, look at this. In John, Judges 6, 14, it says this. The Lord turned to him and said, go with the strength you have and rescue Israel from the Midianites. I am sending you. Don't mistake, I'm sending you, Gideon. I know you think you're nobody. I know you've never won, fought a real war in your life. And you're gonna have to, we're gonna go to war, but I'm with you. And I want you to understand this, I'm sending you and I know what I'm doing. You know what God is saying to somebody here? With me, you're more than enough. You come right now where, where you're at. You come with your pain, you come with your hurt, you come with your addiction, you come with your failures, you come with your past, you come with your, your crazy history, just come. Go with the strength you have. I know what I'm doing. You say, how could God use somebody like me that failed over and over and over? And God says, that's what I do. I use people that no one ever thought I would use, and I use them to do great things for my glory. Come on, give God some praise that God uses regular old people. God did not look for the strongest guy in the neighborhood. The scripture says that Gideon said his family was the weakest and he was the weakest of the family. So I could just see Gideon. He doesn't have any muscle. He's a scrawny guy. He's a guy that's never fought a fight in his life. And God says, I want you, mighty hero, to go out there and defeat the whole Midianite army that you've been oppressed by for seven years. I'm going to use you to bring victory to my whole people. God spent some time convincing Gideon. Yes, I'm sending you. Yes, I'm calling you. Yes, you're a mighty hero. Yes, you're a man of God. Yes, I'm going to do it through you. He, yes, I am with you. Now, the reason he had to spend time convincing him the reason he had spent time convincing him, because half of chapter six is just God convincing him to, to, to say yes to the call. But why would God spend so much time convincing Gideon? This is why. If he doesn't convince Gideon, he can't reach them. Some of us, I want you to get this. You've been stuck on procrastination far too long. You've been stuck being, getting prepared far too long. Every time there's a call on your life, you say, I got to pray about it. You're not praying. 
You're just making excuses. How much more confirmation does God need to give you for finally for you to accept the call on your life? Could it be that you're using prayer as an excuse for not doing what you know God already called you to do that was confirmed since you were a little boy? And you know what that means? You're going to finally have to say yes, and you're going to have to say no to your comfort zone. You're going to have to say no to your, your procrastination. You have to say no, come on, to your, your inability. Yes, I can't do it, but there's a God that's called me, and he can do it. All I need to do is just say yes, and God will do the rest. Right. Write that down. I like that. I was like almost a rap. You say yes, and God will do the rest. Because you're serving the God that's nothing but the best. All right, there you go. It's not my fault someone goes to hell on my watch. Mm -mm, I'm telling them. I'm sending you. But look at the scripture. God is calling Gideon, but he's calling us to rescue people in this year. In these next 21 days. What will Easter be? Will it just be about the bunnies and the eggs? And you're having a nice little Christian Easter party and everybody's just looking for eggs and you didn't witness to one person, invite one person to church. It's getting quiet up in this Presbyterian church right here. All right, let's keep going. <laughs> in Jude 23 it says this. Look, now, I'm talking, I didn't write this. It's scripture right here. Rescue those who are living in danger of hell's fire. Oh, no, no, pastor. It's just not politically correct for you to talk about hell. Not right now, not no more, okay? But the scripture talks about there's people that are headed for hell, and if we don't rescue them, they, they go to hell. You're rescuing them from hell. They're headed to hell. If you do nothing, if you don't tell them about Jesus, they go to hell for eternity. There are no do-overs. And some of those people are in our homes. Some of those people we're working with for years. And we never, everybody came out of the closet, but you didn't. They still don't know you go to the way we're allowing. They still don't know your testimony. They still don't know what God has done in your life. And God is saying, that's over. I'm calling you out to go rescue those that are in danger of hell's fire. And I want to say this. Apart from God, your life is hellish. Wait, wait, we're talking about pastor. Well, hell is a place of darkness. Hell is a place of torment. Hell is a place of hopelessness. Hell is a place of destruction. And what I'm saying is, apart from Christ, your life is becoming more hellish. It's becoming darker. You're becoming more miserable. The levels of destruction are becoming bigger. You feel like you're losing your mind. You're losing your family. You're losing your marriage. You're losing your health. You're losing everything. It's becoming hellish. And you're thinking, is there any way out? And I have some good news for you. There is a way out. A way out. And his name is Jesus Christ. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. That's a big word. Saved. So now we see God's on a rescue mission. God rescues people through people. And the last thing I want to say today is God gives us rescue instructions. The plan of salvation was already here in the story with Gideon. We see finally Gideon accepts the call of God on his life. 
He's finally convinced. He goes, okay, I'll take the call. If you're saying you proved to me over and over and over that you're with me, let's go rescue Israel from these Midianites that are warriors that have never lost a battle. These Midianites, they have, they have a cavalry. They have, they, they, they have weapons and they have arrows and they got swords and we got nothing. We don't have horses. We don't have weapons. We don't even have food. We've been brought to the point of starvation. But if you're saying, let's do it, let's do it. I know that maybe people look at my record and they look at my life and they'll never count me out and count me in. But you've counted me in? Well, let's do it. I don't have the experience, but God, you have all the experience. Let's do it. I'm weak, but you're strong. Let's do it. So God gives him instructions. Instruction number one, he gives Gideon, trust in my strength and not your own. Say it with me. Trust in my strength and not your own. Now you got to get this. That never changes. You don't trust in your strength for spiritual things. You trust in God's strength. You cannot be saved trusting in your own strength, your own willpower, your own righteousness. You need to trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ. That's why some of us, you need to get out of religion. Because you know what religion focuses on? Your strength. What you do. And you'll never be saved to see a miracle of God focusing on how strong you are. So now they're ready to go to battle. And I want you to give you a big, a little background of it. The Midianites, just their army, and there's like other armies that join in to annihilate Israel once and for all. Seven years, we're going to finish them off. The army has now come to the borders of Israel and they've waged war and declared war on Israel. God has been speaking to Gideon behind the scenes. He said, Gideon, this army right here, they, they're going to be defeated. I'm going to give you victory over them. And I'm going to use you. Gideon had a hard time receiving that. But after a long conversation, Gideon finally said yes to the call. He blew a trumpet, a shofar. And in Israel, what they would do when they were ready to go to war, there was a call of arms. And they would blow a trumpet and it would be a certain sound. And when that sound of the trumpet went off, all the warriors or all the men of that nation would come together. 32,000 men responded. The Midianite army has over 135,000 men, plus they have other nations that have joined them and they're weaponized. This, these are the same people they're fighting against that have oppressed them for seven years and ripped them off of absolutely everything. They raised 32,000 men and Gideon says, I got 32,000, let's go fight. But look at, look at this in verse seven, I mean chapter seven, verse one. It says, so Jerubbaal, that is Gideon, and his army got up early and went as far as the spring of Herod. The armies of Midian were camped north of them in the valley near the hill of Moriah. The Lord said to Gideon, you have too many warriors with you. If I let ye, all of you fight the Midianites, the Israelites would boast to me that they have saved themselves by their own strength. Therefore, tell the people, whoever is timid and af or afraid may leave this mountain and go home. So 22,000 of them went home, leaving only 10,000 were willing to fight. But the Lord told Gideon, there are still too many. Bring them down to the spring, and I will test them to determine who will go with you and who will not. When Gideon took his warriors down to the water, the Lord told him, divide the men into two groups. In one group, put all those who cup, their, cup water in their hands and lap it up with their tongues like dogs. And the other group put all those who kneel down and drink, the, uh, drink, who drink their 
mouths to the, with their mouths to the stream. Only 300 of the men drank from their hands and all, and all the others got down on their knees and drank with their mouths in the stream. The Lord told Gideon, with these 300 men, I will rescue you and give you victory over the Midianites. Send all the others home. Like, whoa. Now, this is a messed up battle here now. Because God is setting this up. He goes, you know, the faith that you're going to need is faith in my strength and not your strength. And with 32,000, I know you're still outnumbered. I'm going to give you victory for sure in this. But if I give you victory with the 32,000, you might be tempted to think it was you. And I never want you to think that you could save you, that you can deliver you, that you can do the spiritual miracles. I do it. You trust in me. I'll do it through you, but I do it. So I don't want you to get mixed up faith here. So you got too many. 32,000 against 135, still too many. Because I already know how you think. If you guys did win, you're going to think you're bad. We're bad. You've been telling the stories, man, it was 32 against 135,000. You should have seen us, man. We just took care of business. He goes, so we're going to eliminate that temptation. So send everybody that's scared home. And imagine that statement. Anybody scared, go home. 22,000 of them <laughs> took off, man. And the other 10,000 like, oh my gosh, you didn't just leave us. <laughs> I'm sure the other 10,000 were thinking, we should leave too, guys. What do you think? So he goes, you know, 10,000 against 135,000, still too much. He goes, just send them to the stream. And those that cup water when they're drinking from their hand, keep those. And the other ones, send them home. You go home, you go home, you go home, you go home, you go home. Nine hundred and seven, nine thousand seven hundred of them go home, go home, go home. And then they were left with 300. And I'm sure, or maybe Gideon thought it was going to be the other way around. Separate those 300. Okay, with 9,700, we could work with that. We could do that. He goes, nah, the other 97 go home, 100 go home, 300. And I will save. Your nation, rescue them with just 300. And what God is saying, when you feel outnumbered, you think you can't do it. You're, you know you can't do it, but I can do it. And when I give you an assignment, go out with my strength, not your own. The second instruction he gave them was simple. Believe that I have already given you the victory. Someone say, believe. I've already given you the victory. So he told Gideon, he goes, I think you're still a little scared. And I can't give you victory if you don't believe I've already given you victory. See, Jesus' work that he already did, it's already finished. He already died for your sins. He already destroyed the works of the devil. This is not something he's going to do. It's something he already did. Gideon needed to believe that because he didn't believe it originally. So God took him down into, he says, why don't you go with your, your, your assistant and go down, sneak down into the enemy's camp and hear what they're saying. So he sneaks down into the enemy camp and he hears one of the men say, I just had a dream, man. And then the guy goes, what was the dream about? And he gives him the dream. He goes, that could only mean one thing, that God has given Gideon victory. And the Bible says when he heard that God had gave him victory, he ran back to his troops. And with the 300, he says, God has given you victory. Let's go down. Now just follow my lead and we're going to get this victory. We're going to get it right now. You know what that means? Some of us right now, you believe that there's a call on your life. And what God is doing right now, he's building your faith one more time. Because you got to believe that whatever you're facing right now, you got victory in. And I, it, see, victory comes the same exact way by believing and declaring. Someone say, believe and declare. If you believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died, from the, died and rose again from the dead, you'll be saved. See, someone say, believe and declare. See, if you don't got guts to declare your victory, you'll never have victory. 
There's a time in your life that you got to stop declaring your weakness. You got to stop declaring your addiction. You got to stop declaring your past. You got to stop declaring your problems and start declaring your victory. Yes, I feel addicted, but who the sun sets free is free indeed. I receive my freedom right now. And the last thing, follow my instructions. Now, I'm going to end it with this, that God gave Gideon some really crazy instructions. They're ready to go to war, and I, and I don't know about you, but I want a good battle plan. Like, how are we going to do this, God? He goes, this is how we're going to do it. I want you to take a clay jar, just a clay jar, 300 of them. Okay, I gathered the clear jars. A little torch. I got the torches, 300 torches, 300 clay jars. What else? Okay, a horn. Everybody get a horn. A shofar, just a little horn. Everybody get a horn. A horn, a clay jar, 300 horns, 300 clay jars, and then three, what's the three, other one? Torches. I'm just making sure you guys are following along. <laughs> and just go out to battle with that. Tell the guys just to follow your lead. So he breaks up the 300 into three groups of 100. And they're up on a hill. And the Midianites are in a valley. And they basically surround on top the Midianites. And then Gideon does something crazy. He just blows a horn, his hundred, his hundred. Do, 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 do. I don't know what it is, but it's on that. Do, 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 do. Something like that. And then the other two groups, do, 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 do. right? And then he breaks his clay jar. And then he shouts, victory. Breaks his clay jar. Then they just hold up a torch. And when they did that, the Lord confused the Midianites and they got so freaked out, they started killing each other. They're just watching 135,000 warriors kill each other. There's no way anybody could have took credit for that because you know that plan was ridiculous. But I want you to get this. God, see, you know why God gave us, some, sometimes gives us ridiculous plans? And he, follow, he says, follow my lead even if it sounds ridiculous. So you'll never, ever get to the point that you have faith in a method over your God. The power was not in the method because no other army has ever used that tactic ever again. I know this tactic's serious, man. We don't need nuclear weapons or nothing. Just clay jars, a few little trumpets, and take them out. I saw it in Gideon. He did it. We all know that the plan sounded ridiculous. And I think that's the way God has set this up. The plan almost sounds ridiculous. That you've lived and I've lived a sinful life my, our whole lives. And that God will send his son to pay the price for all of your sins. And all you have to do is believe in the sacrifice that will pay for your sins. He'll forgive you of every one of your sins and give you eternal life and give you a purpose for your life. Turn your losses into victories and begin to restore your life if you just believe in him. I know it sounds ridiculous, but it's always sounded ridiculous because it's all God and it's not us. Just following the instructions trusting in God and not their strength. They got a victory. And this is what God wants to bring to your friends and relatives. So our instructions are simple. Number one, write down 10 names. You're going to do it or not, but I'll tell you, it sounds silly, but write down 10 names and let God use your writing skill. You do the possible, let God do the impossible. Get 21 flyers when you leave and invite one person a day. You can invite them on Facebook. You can invite them, take a picture of it and duplicate it and Invite one person a day. And then Sunday, I mean, on Easter, bring, come to the Easter service celebrations. Maybe Good Friday is the first Friday, Good Friday you've ever showed up. Show up, do more than you've ever done. Just show up and bring somebody. 
Sunrise service is going to be here celebrating the resurrection, power of Jesus Christ. We're going to be here outside, outside. So that's going to be outside service. Come that service. There's nothing like a six o'clock service right before the sun rises. Do something you've never done to start experiencing a next level living that you've never had. Just follow the instructions. Let God do the miracle. For some of you, keep coming on Sunday. And see what God does. I always say, give, me, give us a year of your life and see what God does in a year. The other thing is that after you invite someone, bring a resurrection offer. Think about God, what can I bring on Easter that shows I am grateful for what you've done? Nobody has to do that, but just ask God. Because God will never give you an answer to that if he doesn't have a mission for that. In your life and the lives of others. And then sign, sign up for the marriage challenge. Make sure you get the books and the material, the $25. Sign up right now. I think right now we have 300 books and material left. Sign up today. Do, your, do the possible and then invite someone and sign them up. Now what happens if once those 300 are gone, this is what we're going to do. Once those 300 are gone, we're going to search for more so we can continue expanding. We're just trying to find all, right now under COVID, it's a little hard to find some stuff, but we're going to do everything we can, scurry the land looking for those books and believe we'll find them. Because I believe that there's a provision for the match. And God says, just do this part and let me release the rest. The rest, the rest is not released yet, but let's do this part, get the 300, knock it out, and I believe God will release, release the rest. How many believe we could do that? How many are excited about what God is doing? Who are the ones that God is going to use to rescue them? He's going to use us. Pastor Robert, can you please close us out, please? Let's give the Lord a big hand. He's a good God. Man. Wow, what a great word. Let's all bow our heads and close our eyes for a minute. If you're online right now, you could do, do, do the same. Just bow your head and close your eyes for a second. Before we leave today, we want to give you an opportunity for prayer for those that haven't given their life to God yet, this is going to be your opportunity. Just a reminder, on your way out, there's some ushers, there's greeters out there. We have a bunch of flyers. We order thousands and thousands of flyers you could grab on the way out. Really 20 days before, you could grab 20 days before Easter, you could grab 20 flyers, pass them out. But before we leave today, every head bow, every eyes close. If you need prayer in a moment, we're going to ask you to come up. We'd love to pray with you. We want to spend some time with you and maybe it's a marriage problem you're going through, finance, bad report from the doctor, an addiction, whatever you're going through. Before you leave, come up. We'd love to pray with you. And here's the last thing. As you have your head bowed and your eyes closed, I want you to think about your life for a moment. You're online right now. You can just do the same. Just bow your head and I want you to think about your life for a second. I'm going to ask you a question right now. If you were to die today, where will you spend eternity? Where are you going? On a scale from one to 10, where's your relationship with God? Is it about a one or two? You're thinking, man, I, yeah, I'm way down. I, 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 need, I need to rededicate. I, I need to surrender to God or, man, I want to start my relationship with him. If you're saying you want to be forgiven of your sins, this is going to be your time right now. Say, man, yeah, I got sins. I, I want God to forgive. I want to get right with God. Maybe you just came back to church today or maybe you're watching this online. You're back. You're saying, man, I need to rededicate my life to God today. So again, if you were to pass away today, where are you going? Have you put your faith in Jesus? It's not about a religion. It's not about this building. It's about a relationship with God. And if you're there right now and you're saying, Pastor, I need God. I need him in my life. I need to surrender. I would love for him to forgive me of all my sins. Man, I want to make sure that if I died today, that I would go straight to heaven. Because all those who put their faith in Jesus, they have eternal life. All those who put their faith in Jesus they receive eternal life. All those that reject Jesus, they don't accept what Jesus did on the cross. There's a place called hell that's awaiting for that person that says, no, I don't want Jesus. I reject him. I don't want to be forgiven. I just want to do life my way. And you reject Christ. The Bible says there's a real hell 
But if you're saying, man, that's not me. I believe in what Jesus did on the cross. I need to get right with God. I want to be forgiven. I want to make sure if I die today, I would go straight to heaven. If that is you, you're saying, that's me, Pastor. I want to give my life to God today. I want to rededicate my life to Him. If that is you, I want you to slip your hand up when I count to three. You're saying, man, that's me. I need God. One, two, three. Raise your hands right now. Say, that's me, Pastor. See the hand there. See a hand there. See a hand there. See a hand way in the back over there. See some hands in the back. That's me. I need God right now. I want God in my life. I can't do this on my own anymore. I need God. I want salvation. I want Jesus. See a hand over there. See a hand over there. All those. I want everybody to stand up at this time. Everyone to stand up. If you just raised your hand right now, I want you to come meet me here in the front. And we're going to lead you in a prayer today of salvation. All those who just raised your hands, come on down. This is your day. Come on down. This is your day. Even if you didn't raise your hands, you are saying, man, I need God. I need God right now. Come. This is your day. Come, come. Come, you guys. Come, come, come. Yes, this is your day. This is your day. This is your day. Come, come, come. Yes, so that's me. I need God. I need to come back to God. That's me. Come, come, come. We got a family coming. Come on down. We're waiting for you. Come on, church. Give a big round of support. Come on down. This is it. Yes. Come, come. Come. This is your day. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Bring them down. Eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29. You guys come up as well too? 30, 31. Give them a big round of applause. 31 so far. I'm counting here. This is it. Maybe you're at your seat right now. In a moment, we're going to pray. And maybe you're at your seat right now thinking, man, I should have went down there. It's okay. You can say that prayer right there at your seat. God's going to save you right there. But maybe if you say that prayer at your seat, just let one of us know. We want to pray with you. We have another one. Yeah, come on up, sweetie. Come, come. Another one. That's 30. Was that 32? Or... Come on down. Yeah, this is your day. Just let one of us know. want to pray with you and help you with your neck walk, your walk with Christ. The next step here is start it at the way. That's your next step. So after we pray here, you have a prayer partner there. We're going to exchange a phone number, and they're going to get you signed up for the next step. I want every head bowed, every eyes closed in this room. You're watching this online right now, maybe from home, maybe from a workplace. And you're saying, that's me, Pastor. I need God right now. Say this prayer right where you're at. Every head bowed, every eyes closed. Repeat after me. Say, Jesus, I ask forgiveness of all my sins. I repent from all the wrong that I've done. Jesus, come into my heart. Become my Lord and Savior. From this day forward, I am a disciple. I am a child of God. Holy Spirit, fill me. Set me free from all my bad habits, all my addictions. Today, I start my new life with you. Thank you for saving me. I am born again. I'm on my way to heaven. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Give all those a round of applause. You're watching online. You can go to igotsaved.com and we'll help you with your walk with God. Don't forget Wednesday, you guys, we're back online with the interview, How to Be Happy, part part three now. Awesome. Part four. Remember anything you're going through, we're believing the power of agreement. As we pray together, there could be a breakthrough right here for you. God bless you. Remember this, if God's for you, who could be against you? Go out there, rescue somebody that needs yes. some help, some hope. Today's their day, and you're going to be the tool God's going to use. Love you guys.